wait until you hear it. <laughs> um, I must say, I, I really enjoy coming down to BDP to, to these sessions, but it's because I learn more than the clients do when I have to come down, because they know much more about these drugs than, than I would do. So, and I will finish by showing you that we actually have changed um, with our ideas and our research and things that we're going to do. So, many of you probably think when you talk about, think about the brain, about the brain functioning in terms of mood, memory, consciousness, and craving. Well, I'm a neuroscientist, so I don't think about these things like emotions and things like that. Really, the brain is just a, a bunch of wires, a very complicated bunch of wires, and that, and that all these wires, these neurons, then electrical signals uh, go along, and then they release chemicals. Uh, so to me, everything that is mood, addiction, movement, or whatever, is electrical and chemical. And I, I will try to explain to you how uh, we think that that, 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 that underpins uh, the drug use. So I'm going to start with just some very uh, simple biology. Um, but there's a purpose behind it because it will explain some of the things I'm going to talk about uh, later. So most of the neuro all neurons are just uh, sacs with a, with a, a, a kind of sticking a layer around in which proteins sit. And, and morphine, um, the prototypic opioid, all right, binds to uh, a specific protein, a receptor, uh, to produce its response. So if morphine binds to the receptor, then it changes the way these neurons signal. Um, usually, it inhibits them, but uh, that's a, an old thing. Now, I want to tell you something that is absolutely fascinating to me, but probably will bore you a right? But this is the most exciting thing that's happened in the field of, of opiate pharmacology for, since the discovery of the enkephalons. Right? This will come out in Nature next week, and I've just managed to see a copy of it beforehand. Um, and it, it relates to a concept that we're now thinking about uh, called biased agonists. That is that not all drugs that work on the same receptor do the same things. So a standard agonist would bind to a receptor, and then it probably produces a couple of effects inside the cell. We'll just call them responses A and B. Now the idea of a biased agonist is that you might have another drug that will come down, and when it binds to the receptor, it only puts it, this protein into the state that will, that will put us down here. So this drug, unlike this drug, is only producing response A. It's not producing response B. And you've guessed it, the green drug is going to come down and it's going to produce response B rather than response A. So now you're all ahead of most pharmacologists in understanding what the is. But let me just put it into context. For a drug like morphine, we get analgesia, pain relief, that's why we want it clinically, but we get euphoria and respiratory depression, which is what, um, uh, euphoria being the reason it's abused, and respiratory depression being the reason uh, that, it, that it kills people. So, what has happened, all right, is that a group in uh, San Francisco, led by a guy called Brian Kabilka, who got the Nobel Prize last year, for stuff he's already done, all right, he has actually, devised a drug that when it binds to the receptor only produces analgesia. It doesn't produce euphoria and respiratory depression. Now at the moment this is only preclinical research, it hasn't been into humans yet, but it, it, and, and, and the, the molecule they've got is very hard to get into water. So it's not the drug that's going to go forward. But in about five or ten years time, there's going to be a new drug in the clinic that will treat pain Right? that will not produce respiratory depression and euphoria. And I think that's just so exciting. Because I started in this field in 1975 with the discovery of the Enkephalon, so we thought we were going to get one then. All right? um, so it's only just coming now. There you are, you're even ahead of the scientific um, uh, field because uh, they don't know that. The other little bit of, of basic pharmacology is um, I'm going to talk largely about morphine today in the experiments that we do, rather than about heroin. Um, and heroin is a synthetic derivative of morphine. Morphine comes out of the poppy. It has to be con uh, converted to, to, uh, to heroin. Um, and it's basically, you get these two bits stuck on the side. 
Now, why would you convert morphine to heroin? Well, first of all, there's a problem because heroin doesn't bind to the receptor because it's got these two little bits that are stuck on here. Right? It can't bind to the receptor. The whole reason that people prefer to take heroin is that because you've got these two bits stuck on here, this molecule is more soluble in the, uh, the lipid that is the barrier between the blood and the brain. So this molecule gets into the brain faster, but it has to be, this, this bit has to be cleaved off. That's not very really interested in this bit. But this bit has to be cleaved off first before it's active. So we don't use heroin because this bit can be cleaved off while it's just sitting around on the bench in the lab and so on. So I'm going to talk uh, largely about morphine because we know this is entirely stable. So I was really asked to talk about polydrug use and how it contributes to overdose deaths. And these are the latest national figures uh, for two th that are available from 2014. And there's been an increase in, in heroin deaths, uh, in opiate deaths, or deaths where opiates have been mentioned uh, in the death certificate. Largely, uh, nationally, it's heroin with a contribution from methadone and, and tramadol. Um, and anybody who's good at mental arithmetic will know that that doesn't add up to that because there are some other opioids that are involved too. Uh, but I just didn't want to bore you with all the numbers. So, why is it that experienced um, heroin users um, die of overdose. I mean, people like Matt are, are always telling me that, that the, most, the biggest group of, are, are, are people who have been on heroin for about 20 years. And you kind of think that by that time they were quite experienced, all right? And therefore they wouldn't uh, make their mistakes uh, about the amount they were using. And, and that got us into um, thinking about the influence of other drugs on um, heroin uh, and maybe that other drugs make it more dangerous. And the common drugs that uh, heroin users um, take are alcohol, benzodiazepines, cocaine, cannabis, and most recently, pregabalin and gabapentin. Now, I'm a bit disappointed today because the organizers asked Abby Lindman from my group uh, to, to give a talk later on pre and gabapentin, and so I'm not allowed to mention it to you. Um, <laughs> but this is the most exciting bit of what we're doing. Um, so, uh, well, I guess I won't mention it. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been doing a lot of work on, on alcohol, and I'll explain to you uh, why um, we concentrated largely on alcohol, uh, and we have so far uh, only done a little bit on cocaine and nothing on desert or These are some statistics I took from the, the government website, which is um, the mention of, of uh, heroin deaths where other substances were also mentioned. And you can see here that way back at that in 2000, that the blue line is heroin alone. And so 60% of the heroin deaths, um, the deaths <coughs> only mentioned heroin and not other drugs. There was about 30% where alcohol was mentioned. And you can see that up to 2013, um, then it was changing. That the number with alcohol had, um, mentioned also had increased, and the number for heroin alone had decreased, and the numbers with benzodiazepines and methadone had started to increase. So there are drugs present at, at death. Now, they could be present at death just because they took it the day before and it's still hanging around. And it doesn't mean that the fact that it's uh, discovered um, at, 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 at post-mortem, that it means it caused death. Um, but you can see that there are a number of other drugs there. So what we've been doing in my lab is trying to work out um, whether or not they do contribute um, to, uh, to, over, uh, to overdose deaths. And in this study in 2007, when we started um, thinking about this, um, that they showed that in those um, deaths where ethanol was present, so I'll talk about ethanol rather than alcohol, uh, because, uh, just because that's what a scientist does. Uh, um, the morphine levels were 20 to 50% lower than you might expect 
from an experienced uh, user who might be overdosing. And so this suggests that concurrent alcohol use lowers the lethal heroin overdose threshold. For cocaine, right, the, it seemed that uh, the higher the level of cocaine, the higher the level of, of heroin. So there was a kind of positive correlation between cocaine and, and, and heroin levels. And I don't think anyone's actually fully managed to explain that. And for benzodiazepines, there was no correlation between um, the levels of, of the benzodiazepine in the blood and the levels of, of heroin. So this uh, presence of alcohol actually intrigued us. So this is what I've just been mentioning, that in post-mortem, if you look at the drug levels, then, then when there was uh, low alcohol present, the majority of people had, uh, had, high, had, died, had high morphine levels. And, and when they had uh, low, uh, when they had high alcohol levels, they had low um, morphine levels. And this discounts the idea that, you know, that uh, people get drunk and inject too much, and that's why they overdose. <coughs> so there has to be some underlying reason about why we have this negative <coughs> correlation. So Matt Hickman and I and uh, Anne Langford Hughes got together uh, to try to, uh, to, to um, we first of all wrote a, an editorial for addiction to, to say that people should be studying this. Because in the scientific literature, people try to reduce everything to just one variable. And so people don't try to study two drugs at one time. That's too complicated. We study one drug on one simple system. So we wrote an editorial to try and encourage people to, uh, to think about looking at polydrug um, use and the different aspects. And so we said, well, well, how do opiates and alcohol interact uh, to contribute to overdose deaths? And the first thing is that, well, alcohol's depressant, uh, heroin's depressant, two depressants, one plus one gives you two. And that's the common wisdom. I think if you ask most people, that's what they would, what they would suggest. Potentially, they could synergize. That is, in the presence of alcohol, the effect of heroin could be even greater. <coughs> The third possibility is that, that there's an interaction at the level of tolerance, that alcohol actually reduces um, opiate tolerance. And finally, um, it could be nothing to do with mechanisms. It could just be that when somebody has detoxed, if they have a drink, it might be something which encourages them to take care of it again, and that's when you get a, 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 an overdose. So the first three of these would be uh, what, uh, pharmacological, uh, and this would be uh, more psychological. Now, we focus on um, whether or not alcohol has any effect on opiate tolerance, primarily because I had spent the previous five years studying opiate tolerance. Uh, this is what uh, my lab has been, I mean, working on the underlying mechanisms, the biochemical events. And so we looked to see whether or not there was any interaction of alcohol on the level of opiate tolerance. And our uh, approach is, uh, is to isolate components of drug action. We don't try to mimic what happens in a heroin addict or a heroin user. Uh, that, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to remove as many variables as possible and just ask one specific scientific question. The scientific question being, does alcohol reduce the level of tolerance and to, to morphine? Now, <coughs> this diagram appeared in the literature in about 1999. It, uh, it was a suggestion by, by two people in a review article. Um, and it's never been tested. But it's become part of the, um, the, the scientific fact. Everybody now believes this. Um, and, and what they suggested here, um, with, with great insight, was that what we have plotted up this way is that the dose you have to take to get an effect. So in an inexperienced user, to get some sort of uh, buzz, you would only have to take a small dose. But in somebody who, uh, 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 but to get respiratory depression, you'd have to take a larger dose. So there's quite a gap between these two, and that's your safety margin. That you can get a, a buzz, but you don't get respiratory depression unless you take a lot more, and then you start to get respiratory depression. 
with time, tolerance develops, and this paper suggested that tolerance develops greater to the euphoric effects of, uh, of, of opiates than it does to respiratory depression. And so, uh, when we get to here, to get a euphoric effect, you have to take a big dose, and this is now much closer to the dose that you'd have to take to get respiratory depression. So your safety margin is much, um, is much narrower here. <coughs> now, there's, there's no scientific basis for this whatsoever. Um, but it probably is true. The problem is that for people trying to test this fit, it's very difficult. And we've we've, we've uh, spent many hours trying to develop tests to study um, the rewarding properties of opiates, and whether or not we can develop tolerance to them. And we still haven't got a good test. So we've focused on this large depression um, like, uh, and, and the, the interaction with, uh, with alcohol uh, in terms of um, overdose death. So in my lab, we use uh, mice as our model. We've tried to use humans, but um, uh, the, 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 uh, if anybody wants to ask me afterwards why um, it's harder to work on humans, um, well, one of the easy explanations is it, it's very hard to get ethical approval for a control group. That is, I can't just recruit students into the lab and say, use a dose of heroin, because if they became heroin addicts, then um, the lab would be sued for it. So um, we, we use uh, an animal model. Um, the other reason that we use animals um, is that uh, respiration requires an intact brain system. Some of the other stuff we do in the lab, we do uh, with uh, single uh, neurons or, or just bits of, uh, of tissue. Uh, but um, respiration requires uh, an integration of all of those wires in the brain. So what we're measuring here is the, is, is the uh, animal's ability to breathe. They're running around in a little lab. Uh, a little box that measures the respiration. And in the solid bit here, these are um, completely naive subjects. And if we give them a, a dose of morphine, this, this would give us a reasonable amount of analgesia. They wouldn't, uh, they, um, it's, not, it's not a very high dose. Then what we see is that their respiration comes down, and it's down for about 30 minutes, so that's as long as uh, we want to study. <coughs> in, in, in this group of animals, we pre-treated them for about a week with morphine. And they became tolerant so that when we injected the morphine now, then we didn't get much depression of respiration. So that does show that you do get tolerance to respiratory depression. Um, this is just another way of, of showing these data here. Um, what we do is we measure the area under this curve here, and, and that's that. So that's a measure of how much this has gone down. Um, and this one is that one, so it only went down that one then, so that's that. And so you can see that um, we get a lot of respiratory depression when we give an acute challenge of morphine, but when we've treated the animals for a week beforehand with morphine, then they're tolerant and we get very little respiratory depression. So the first thing is, tolerance does occur to respiratory depression. <coughs> we then wanted to know what an acute dose of alcohol would do. And so we chose a very low dose. So uh, this dose of alcohol doesn't in itself depress respiration. So there's no way we're going to get an additive effect here because um, <coughs> there's no effect to, to add on to. So here we've got our tolerant animals that have been pre-treated with uh, prolonged morphine. Um, and then we give them this morphine challenge. So they're tolerant, we're getting no response to depression. But if we just give them one very low dose of alcohol, <coughs> just five minutes before we give them the challenge dose of morphine to see the respiratory depression, then the respiratory depression comes back. It comes back all the way to the same level we would see in completely naive animals. So a single very low dose of alcohol right, reverses morphine tolerance and brings the respiratory depression back. What about chronic alcohol? Because very few people would just take one dose of alcohol and that again. Um, so what we've done here is um, we've uh, replaced the, the food that the mouse eat, the mice eat with a, a milkshake equivalent. Uh, and in the milkshake, you can either put alcohol or water. So some of our animals in the top here, they just got uh, <coughs> one milkshake, well, sorry, this one, 
No. <coughs> so these guys got no, no ethanol, they got a watery milkshake, but they were exposed to, to morphine for a week before we did the challenge. When we put the morphine in, then they're tolerant. There's no depression here. The lower group, they got alcohol in their food for, for three weeks, uh, and then uh, we, we set them up in this test. And the first thing to note is that their respiration level is lower than in the control group. Now that's not due to the alcohol alone, because in other, uh, I just tried to make this slide less complex, we have another group that only got alcohol, that's all they had, and their respiration was up here. So the alcohol itself is not depressing respiration, but the alcohol with the prolonged morphine, you get depression of respiration. So what we think is happening here is that we've reversed the tolerance with the alcohol, and therefore the, the, the morphine that's hanging around because they've had prolonged morphine exposure is depressing the respiration. If we get them given the challenge, then you get even more depression of respiration. And so this would be someone who is uh, the equivalent of someone who is chronically drinking alcohol, taking uh, heroin, they would get more respiratory depression um, than I was somebody who doesn't drink alcohol um, or somebody who is it's not tolerant. So for both acute and chronic alcohol, we get a reversal of, uh, of, of, of the morphine tolerance. So we then said, well, what about methadone and buprenorphine? If we take our animals and pre-treat them with methadone or buprenorphine for a week, and then do the same experiment again, what does alcohol do now? And what you can see here is that these animals have been treated for a week with methadone, their response to morphine has gone down, so the methadone has, has uh, induced tolerance and you get very little effect to the, to, to the morphine. And now if we do the morphine plus alcohol, well, there's a very small increase, but that's not statistically significant, so we have to say there's no increase at all. So for methadone, there isn't a reversal of the tolerance where we have alcohol, whereas for morphine, which is the active ingredient in heroin, there is a reversal. And similarly for buprenorphine, then chronic buprenorphine reduces the response uh, to the, the, the morphine challenge. And whether or not that's tolerance or just the, the buprenorphine hanging around as an antagonist, uh, we don't know, but it's down. And that too is not increased by, by alcohol. So the effect of alcohol to reverse tolerance is selective to uh, morphine and is not seen with methadone or buprenorphine. Now that's not me saying that alcohol doesn't interact with methadone, all right? Okay, because what I'm saying is that alcohol doesn't reverse methadone tolerance. There could be some other effect of our interaction between alcohol and methadone that we just haven't discovered or studied yet. And, and Abby, who's going to talk about pregabalin, has actually tried some experiments um, <coughs> where she, Methadone and alcohol are the two drugs, both of them will be taken orally, whereas um, heroin and alcohol, one would be oral and one wouldn't. So we thought, well, maybe the interaction between alcohol and methadone is that when you put alcohol in your stomach and in your small intestine, it increases the absorption of methadone dramatically. And you kind of think, somebody must have done that. I mean, you know, we've had methadone for so long, you know. So we went through the literature, and there are no studies on alcohol Effect, uh, no, no studies <coughs> looking at whether or not alcohol would affect um, methadone absorption. So we've done some studies and we cannot find any increase in methadone absorption uh, for, with, if we give alcohol five or ten minutes before. So that came as a surprise to me, um, but it's just the first experiment and I think we need to do a little bit more. Now an awful lot of my funding comes from the American government and their problem is actually with oxycodone rather than with heroin. And so I just have to show you um, that um, alcohol reverses um, tolerance induced by oxycodone. Um, doesn't reverse it as well as it would, as it would reverse morphine tolerance, uh, but it does show some reversal. And I was talking about this to Kathy Stanard, who runs a pain clinic in Southmead. And she was saying, well, you know, Graham, since you've been talking to us about this for years, um, we've started to take much better um, histories of the patients 
And what we've discovered is that a number of our patients who come saying, well, these opiates should put me on for this back pain, they don't work. But you know, sometimes when I have a drink, it does actually, I, I, I do feel pain relief. Well, to me that's that. So that was very encouraging to take me that. So you can all go to sleep now, because I'm going to talk about biochemical things again. The sort of things that, uh, that I dream about at night. <laughs> So what, one of the big contributions to tolerance is that if you activate the receptor for a prolonged period of time, the cell underneath it goes, I don't like this, and it tries to switch off the signaling. And we call, and when it switches off the signaling through the receptor, we call this desensitization. So if you could just put tolerance down there. Desensitization is something is a and what my lab showed a few years ago was that different agonists on the receptor cause this desensitization by different mechanisms. So that when morphine binds to this receptor for a prolonged period of time, this protein that we'll just call PKC, right, this comes up to the receptor and it sticks this phosphate group on. And, and this phosphate group on here means that this receptor doesn't work anymore. So that's desensitized, it doesn't function. If you hit it with anything else, take the morphine on, off, put something else on, it won't work. To our surprise, when we did this with methadone, we found that there was no involvement of this enzyme called PKC. The involvement is now with an enzyme that we'll call GRK. And it also phosphorylates the receptor, but it does it at a different place. And then this other molecule comes along and binds in. And this is also desensitized. But the important thing is that the desensitization, and that is to the, the tolerance, are produced by different mechanisms for morphine and by methadone. And yes, you've got it. Ethanol blocks this enzyme PKC. And so that's why uh, we get a selective reversal of the tolerance uh, that's induced by morphine with, uh, with ethanol, and we don't get a reversal of the tolerance that we've induced uh, with methadone. <coughs> so we have a molecular explanation for the phenomenon that we can see uh, on respiration. Okay, so what about other drugs that might inhibit PKC? So we've got PKC inhibitors, that is, things that drug companies made many years ago just selectively to inhibit PKC. And they do the same. Right. But I was more interested in trying to find drugs that might be taken by people, right, that might have a, an off-target effect to inhibit PKC. Um, the one that we came up with is tamoxifen, the breast cancer treatment drug. So we heard this morning that this, this drug, tamoxifen, uh, blocks the steroid receptor, the estrogen receptor. So it's an estrogen receptor antagonist, that's what it's used therapeutically for, and that's why it's used in, in, in the treatment of breast cancer. But tamoxifen has an off-target effect, a side effect, but it's a very good inhibitor of PKC, and also it crosses the blood-brain barrier. So here you can see that we've tested tamoxifen now against either morphine tolerance, methadone tolerance, or the effect of prolonged buprenorphine. And tamoxifen is exactly the same as alcohol. That is, it reverses the tolerance induced by morphine. These are just two different ways we hear about the morphine treatment, but we've got the same effect. But it has no effect on to reverse the tolerance induced by methadone or the uh, reduction that we saw with buprenorphine. So it's not only alcohol, it's tamoxifen and the correlation or the common target between these two is, is, uh, is PKC. Now I've spoken to, to people that run pain clinics and uh, they say that um, most patients, most, most women who have been treated with tamoxifen for breast cancer, while they're having the tamoxifen wouldn't be in serious pain and so therefore they wouldn't be on serious opiates. So there's no kind of interaction between the things going on in, in, in breast cancer treatment that this relates to. Um, there may very well be a small population of, of heroin users um, who develop breast cancer and give them tamoxifen and, and maybe actually find that uh, heroin is more uh, 
voted when, when they had the thing to them. But I think that's such a small group that nobody would have noticed it um, so far. So, what are we going to do in the future? Well, on my, on my first visit to the BDP, Peter Ellis said, what's all this about gabapentin and free gabapentin use? So we started a gabapentin and free gabapentin program, entirely on Pete's suggestion. Um, on my second visit to the BDP, uh, Pete said, so why is it that when you've been tolerant to heroin and you come off through detox, if you go back on to the heroin, the tolerance develops much more rapidly. So I just stared at that and said, well, I've never heard that before. So he just asked around the room of the, of the clients. And he said, of course, yes, everybody knows that. Yeah. Well, I said, well, look, you know, I know hundreds and hundreds of people that spend all their time researching right, opiate action, and none of us have known that before. So, we tested, the, well, there's lots of potential explanations for this. The second, that when you, when you relapse, you might know you took higher doses the last time, and you think, oh, what is happening? So there's, there's also the psychological explanations. But we thought we'd test it in an animal model. And he's correct. So what we've done here is, um, we, this is a naive group of animals here, this is a respiration. If you give them a dose um, of uh, morphine of, of each day, then it goes down. And the dose wasn't very big, so we didn't get very much tolerance here, but you can start to see a little bit of tolerance. But in the open symbols here, these are a group of animals who, for a week down here, were given morphine. They were tolerant. Then we withdrew them. We had to get special permission from the government to withdraw them, because that's felt to be a, you know, a stressful experience. And then we retested them. And we got, they, 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 they lost their tolerance, so the, 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 the depression of respiration was back down here, just the same as the other group. But then the next day, the response uh, was much less. So this is a development of tolerance. So it does appear that if you've had, um, become tolerant to, to morphine or to heroin, and you come off it, the next time you go back on, your brain has a memory. And that memory, it makes the tolerance develop much more rapidly the next time. So I just asked the government, I shouldn't say this to many, you should be really upset, but I've just asked the government for nearly uh, half a million pounds to study this. And we're quite, we're quite um, confident that we'll get the money because we've got some sexy science in and you always have to look at sexy science. But it's also a very sexy phenomenon because if that is true, maybe we could find out what does this and, therefore, and then we could try to stimulate it or, you know, some other way so that we could induce tolerance without having given them the, more, the heroin before. And therefore, somebody who has come off and relapses, right, wouldn't get any effect of the drug, and this, tolerance, this relapse, um, this development of tolerance would, would already have developed. So that's why this tolerance developed more rapidly in real life. The other thing is that Matt Hickman didn't talk about it this morning, but he's got a really nice paper out recently, which says that <coughs> if you study mortality rates, then there's a higher mortality rate in people who've detoxed from buprenorphine than people who've detoxed from methadone. So methadone gives you more protection, protection later on right, than, than does buprenorphine. And my hypothesis right, is that methadone also puts down this memory and this, this tolerance thing clicks in. But maybe buprenorphine doesn't. Right? And, and that would be that, that I think would be and that's part of the of the, of the grant application. And, and that's something that we're going, to, we're going to study. But that's pure speculation on my part at the moment. <laughs> what we really want to do is um, does tolerance develop more rapidly to the pleasurable effects of heroin? We, we, as I said earlier, we thought long and hard about, about doing this. And one of the guys in my lab came up with this, he came to me one day and said, Graham, can I go to this conference on a workshop on addiction? It's in our resort in northern Italy. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, it sounds like a bit of a jolly. Um, but um, if you can raise your own money, I mean, you can go. You can have a time off. I'll fetch you. <laughs> and so the day that he left, I said, look, uh, Rob, make sure you don't come back with too, big, too good a suntan. But he actually came back with this really clever idea.
the year that he picked up uh, about how to study um, tolerance developing to, in animals, tolerance developing to the pleasurable effects. And so, so hopefully in another um, three or four years, I might be invited back down to BDP uh, to tell you about that. Thank you very much. Oh no, sorry, I can't do that. <laughs> I have to just say that I don't do any work anymore. I just uh, sit and, and, and go to committee meetings and so on. Uh, these are the guys that do the work in the lab. Uh, Aaron Kelly is my long-term collaborator. Suzanne Audrey and Matt Aikman, uh, we work closely with, with and I'm Hughes, and uh, we've got some other collaborators uh, around the world. And we get funding from the NIH and from the Medical Research Council. Thank you very much.